Well, hello. My name is Mary Cutler, and I'm the naturalist for the Tippecanoe County Park and Recreation Department. In this short video, I hope to provide an introduction to the great variety of wildlife found in the state of Indiana. While it may seem that we don't have many of the real eye-catching animals that we're all familiar with, things like pandas and whales and elephants, we do have a great variety of very interesting animals that live in our state. And I feel it's important for every person who lives in Indiana to know a little bit about their wildlife neighbors. So what we're going to do is learn about some of the basic things that you have to understand to know what kind of animals live here in Indiana. So let's start with the first thing that all animals need to live in a particular place. They need to have, of course, homes. In the science world, we call these homes habitats. And habitats must include four things for animals to be found in a particular place. They have to include food and water, and that seems kind of obvious, right? They have to include shelter, and shelter has to be things that can protect the animal from the weather, from predators that might want to eat them, and they have to have protected places to raise their young. And they also need a certain amount of space. So for example, you can think about, you know, a coyote would need a lot more space than a little white-footed mouse. So those four elements or components of habitat must be found in a particular place for animals to live there. So habitat is key. The second thing we're going to learn about today is that animals develop certain characteristics to help them survive in these habitat places. And we call these things adaptations. And adaptations are nothing more than certain features that enable them, like a key and a lock, to fit in a particular habitat. So adaptations can be something we can physically see on an animal. Those are the obvious physical features. Or they can behavior, be behavioral, the way an animal acts in a particular environment. And so these adaptations help them fit in the habitat and survive there. So to understand these things, first of all, let's go back to habitats for a minute and think about the kind of habitats that are found in our state. So there's many wonderful places where animals can live in Indiana, but there are three main habitats. And the first one is the woodland or forest habitat. And you guys know forest is a place where lots of trees grow close together in an area. And so Indiana was actually at one time mostly covered with forest. 87% of our state was covered with forest or woodland habitat. That's habitat number one. And then we have, fortunately for us, a great, wonderful variety of aquatic or water-filled habitats. We have rivers and lakes and ponds, streams and wetlands. And these places are home to a great variety of very interesting animals. So aquatic habitats are number two. And then finally in Indiana, in kind of a small part of our state, we have grasslands or prairie habitats. We have areas with tall grasses and beautiful flowering plants and very few or no trees. And the grasslands are found in our state, basically up toward the Chicago area in the northwest corner of our state. So those are our three main habitats, and hopefully those little drawings kind of help you picture what those places are like. So now let's come back, now that we know what habitats we have, and focus in on some very specific animals, three animals that I have here, that help us understand how the adaptations of these animals fit them to those uh, special habitats. And the first thing I want to say about these animals Obviously, they're not alive, right? They're not moving, correct? But these animals were not killed so that I could use to teach you about them today. All the animals that we use educationally to help kids and adults learn about wildlife died in accidental ways, okay? So these are animals that actually live in Indiana, but fortunately for us, I did not kill them so you could look at them. So I hope you feel better about that. So let's start with this beautiful guy over here. This is a great horned owl. And great horned owls are very common, large predator or meat-eating birds that live in our forest or woodland habitats. And if you think about what a forest is like, it can be kind of a dark place, right? Very shady. Lots of tall tree trunks and lots of dark branches. And the owl hunts at night, correct? Mostly. Most owls hunt at night. And so these animals have to have, first of all, a way to hide from the things that they want to eat in the forest. And because it's dark, and because all the materials that are growing there are kind of dark colored, as you look at this bird, you can see that it has colors that match that woodland habitat. It has kind of speckled brown and white and tan colors that blend in very well or camouflage in that forest habitat. So that's adaptation number one. So he's hiding, but he's got to be able to find his prey under the cover of darkness. So when you look at the owl, you can see that it has very, very large eyes. And all owl, I, owls have very large eyes that help them to gather the limited amounts of light in the forest environment at night. So large eyes to gather light, adaptation number two. But let's say, even with a little bit of light, they can't see the prey. 
So they have another adaptation that's very important to them as well. They have excellent hearing. And although you can't see the ears on this owl, these are not ears, these are just feathers coming up, we call them ear tufts. They have excellent hearing. Their ears are located on the sides of their head like ours, and they're very good at detecting prey under the cover of darkness, even without seeing it. So excellent, excellent hearing. Can't see that adaptation, but if I could remove all those feathers from that owl's face, you'd be able to see the large ear openings. And then finally, the owl, after it hides and finds its prey, has to be able to catch and kill and eat the prey, right? So it has very long, sharp talons on the end of the feet for grabbing and killing the prey. They tend to kill their prey with their feet. And then a very sharp, curved beak, which helps it to tear that prey apart into bite-sized bites. So as we look at this bird, we can very easily see the adaptations that fit it to that forest habitat. Now let's move to the aquatic habitat. And here's an animal that hopefully you're all familiar with. This is a beaver. And beavers are very, very interesting animals with all kinds of amazing adaptations that fit them to aquatic habitats. So the first thing to think about is we've placed them in the aquatic habitat because you know that they like to swim and build their homes in the water. But they also have a foot in the woodland or forest habitat because they have to get their building materials and their food from that kind of habitat. So they need more than one habitat to survive. As we look at the beaver, we can see adaptations wherever we look. I like to say uh, they're kind of like a walking tool chest of adaptations because there's just so much to see on this animal. But if we look at the animal just as a whole, it's a dark brown color and has very interesting fur. And think about living in the water in Indiana all year long, right? In the winter it gets really cold, correct? So you would need to have a, a coat that can keep you not only dry but very warm. So they have a double coated fur with long silky guard hairs that are waterproof and a dense undercoat to keep them warm and to keep that coat in good shape all throughout the year so it can do its job of keeping you warm and dry. They have special toenails on their hind feet, one on each hind foot, that are split in half like the teeth of a comb. And as they groom themselves with those hind feet, think of your dog scratching his coat with his back leg, right? They're separating the furs and they're spreading oil from their body all through that coat to make it waterproof. So there's a neat adaptation. They of course have webbed feet for paddling in the water. They have this wonderful long, broad tail used not to pat down mud on a dam like many people think but to steer the animal in the water. They smack that tail on the on the surface of the water to warn other beavers of danger and they also use it to kind of uh, prop up as they're chewing on a tree. So think about if you have a bike and you use a kickstand, holds that bike up and the tail kind of does the same kind of thing. And then the last adaptation, everyone always notices it with the beaver, are these really unusual teeth, right? So I have a skull of a beaver here, so you can see the teeth a little bit better. And they're very, very long, right? And if you think about it, this guy has got to chew on hard things all throughout its life for food and building materials. So if you had to come down every morning and chew on your kitchen table leg for breakfast, right? Something happened to your teeth? They would get shorter over time. They would wear away. So beavers have teeth, these front teeth, that grow throughout their life. So as he's chewing on hard trees day after day after day, a little bit more of the tooth grows out continuously so that he's always got a chewing surface to work with. And the other thing you notice, of course, is that they're orange on the front, sort of strange looking, and white on the back. And you might think that's because he doesn't brush, right? Not the story. They have iron, which is a mineral compound in the front of the teeth, which make the front of the teeth harder than the back. And so as they're chewing, the teeth come together and sharpen themselves into a nice knife-like edge. So they've always got a sharp knife to cut on the trees that they use for food and building materials. So beavers, and we could go on, there's so many things to talk about with beavers, but those are some of their basic adaptations. And let's move finally to this last guy, an animal that lives in the grassland or prairie habitat. And this is a badger, a very, very unique animal found in Indiana. And so if you think about grasslands, places with those tall grasses and sort of thin, beautiful flowering plants, there's not many places to hide really. There's no trees to hide behind or up in. And so many grassland or prairie animals are diggers. They create their own safe shelter under the ground. And so as you look at the badger, you can see his really long claws and very, very strong claws that he uses for digging. You also notice that he's got a very flattened shape. Okay, this is not how I picked him up off the road. He really looks like this. They're very flat. They have a wedge-shaped head. And those are adaptations to help him kind of push himself through the soil. 
And finally, you notice the sort of mottled or sort of flecked colors of sort of tan and white and light brown. And as he's moving around through the bottom of a grassland or prairie, there's dead grasses and plants that sort of have those colors. So he's got the excellent camouflage to blend in with the prairie habitat. So hopefully by looking at these three animals and talking about the habitats where they live, you've seen that connection between the adaptations that they have that fit them in those environments. So the big thing to really remember as you guys go out and study wildlife and observe wildlife in your own areas is that habitat is the key. If we want to have unique and interesting animals living in our state, we have to have the habitats that they need first. And you can play a role in this. In your own backyards, you can create simple habitats, enhance your habitats, make them better for butterflies and other kinds of insects and for songbirds and for small furry mammals. Your backyard can become a home or habitat as well. And as you get older, you can work to protect the really special large habitats that we need in our state so that we'll always have a great variety of wonderful animals that can call Indiana home. So thank you for watching.